Hello. Today we're going to start talking about special relativity. We have two goals for today. We'll define something we call the space-time interval. And so a lot of people, when they uh, dive into special relativity, start by focusing on things that are different for various observers. For instance, lengths of things, distances between two things, time intervals between two things, between two events. Those can be different depending on the observer. But the space-time interval is something that, in fact, everybody agrees on. So it's interesting to start with that. And we're going to use the space-time interval to do an example problem. Okay, so we'll start by talking about, you know, what is this thing we call special relativity? So this really traces its uh, roots back to Einstein. Uh, although people were starting to think about it before him as well. So uh, anyway, there's also special relativity as opposed to general relativity. So general relativity includes effects of gravity on light and on clocks, in fact. So a clock in a gravitational field acts differently from a clock that is not in a gravitational field. And light is also affected by gravitation. So for instance, starlight can be deflected by passing close to a, uh, an object with mass. And we can see this um, at, with solar eclipses. So you can see starlight being deflected by the sun. Special relativity doesn't involve gravity at all. Okay, so it's a little less complicated. Still have some crazy things that come out of it, but at least we don't have to account for gravity. And in general, relativistic effects are associated with traveling at a speed close to the speed of light. But relativity even sometimes matters at low speeds. And magnetic effects can be actually be viewed as kind of relativistic phenomena. Okay, so what do all observers agree on? And as I mentioned before, um, often people disagree on various things. You know, things depend on the uh, reference frame you're in. But a lot of times, as we've seen before in physics, conservation laws, things that are the same, are very important. Okay, and here is one such invariant quantity that applies in relativity, and there's another one of these, which we're not going to get to, but uh, that's all right. This one's called the space-time interval. And so we do this. We say, you're an observer, observer one, two events take place, they're separated in time by a time interval of delta t, and they occur at different locations, and those locations are distance delta x apart. So they're separated spatially by delta x and in time by delta t. For observer two, observer two uh, will be moving relative to observer one. Okay? So they're in a different reference frame. And so observer two sees these two events, and observer two says the time intervals between the two, two events, the time interval between the two events is delta t prime, and the uh, locations at which these events occur are separated in space by delta x prime. And so the space time interval equation says that basically every observer agrees on the value of the space-time interval. So space-time interval squared is c delta t squared minus delta x squared. So you'd work that out for observer 1. And observer 2 could work out the equivalent thing, c delta t prime all squared minus delta x prime all squared. And both observers, in fact any observer, would agree any observer in a uh, inertial reference frame at all, at least, those observers would agree on the value of the space-time interval. One thing to notice here is the units in our equation. Okay, so delta x we measure in units of length, and then we've got a time interval, so we've got time multiplied by a speed, c is the speed of light in vacuum, and when you multiply 
speed by time, unit-wise, you get length. So in some sense, we're measuring our time in units of length here. Okay, so bottom line is all observers who are moving at constant velocity agree on the value of the space-time interval. Here's our equation again. So let's do an example here. So you're going to stay on Earth, and you see Isabel traveling past you in the Earth in her rocket. And she's traveling at 80% of the speed of light. And Isabel travels to some imaginary planet we'll call planet Zorg. And Zorg happens to be in the same reference frame as the Earth, so it's at rest with respect to Earth. According to you, Zorg is 20 light years away. Now, this is something we have to be very careful of when we start talking about relativity. Okay? Usually we just say, Zorg is 20 light years away from Earth. But, in fact, in this case, we're very careful to say, according to you, that's the distance between Earth and Zorg. According to other people, it's going to turn out the distance is something else. And times, we're going to say, you know, the time between these two events is such and such according to somebody. Okay, so we're going to be very careful to specify uh, who the observer is. Okay, fine. So there's our setup so far. So, let's start with these questions. According to you, how long does a light pulse take to travel from Earth to Zorg? Okay, so you flash a laser pointer from Earth towards Zorg. Someone on Zorg eventually picks up that light, light pulse after a long time. How long does it take that light pulse to travel? And according to you, how long does it take Isabel to reach planet Zorg? Okay, so let's try that out. So we'll start with the light pulse. And now, first of all, we're using units that you're not quite used to. Okay, so we've got distance measured in light years. And you can certainly convert that to meters if you want, but let's not. What is a light year? A light year is the distance that light travels in a year. Okay, so if we send a light pulse off on a trip and the distance, according to us, is 20 light years, that light pulse should therefore take 20 years. So light travels at the rate of one light year per year. And so this light pulse takes 20 years. And we have to say again, according to you, the light pulse takes 20 years to reach Zorg. Okay, so we're using different units here. We're using times in years and distances in light years. Okay, you can convert them to seconds and meters and all that if you want, but it's a lot easier actually to work with light years and years in this case. Okay, then we'll worry about how long Isabel takes. So first of all, does Isabel take more than 20 years, less than 20 years, 20 years? How long? Well, for one thing, Isabel is going slower than the light, right? So we do expect Isabel to take longer. Do we have to do any crazy relativistic equations to work this out? Absolutely not. Okay? So, we can just go back to constant velocity equation. Okay? Uh, velocity times time is distance. So therefore, time is distance over speed. So we could do the similar ca the calculation for the light in a similar way. So for the light, we say 20 light years over C, and one light year over C happens to be years. Okay, C is the speed of light. And that, the reason for that is uh, we could say C is one light year per year. Okay, that's one way to measure C. It's certainly 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second, but it's also one light year per year. Okay, so when you say C is a light year per year, the light year units cancel out and the years come up on top. Okay, so we get 20 light years over 1 light year per year, and we get uh, 20 years for the light. Now with Isabel's case, she's going a little slower. She's going to 4 fifths C, so she's going at the rate of 4 fifths of light year per year, according to you. And so we end up with 5 fourths times 20 years. So we get 25 years. So the light takes 20 years. Isabel takes 25 years, according to you. Okay. So we haven't done anything crazy so far, aside from the units we're in. Got to use to that. But uh, so far, we're using very simple equations.
velocity times time is distance. That's according to you. Okay, so now, how about according to Isabel? Now we're going to look at things from Isabel's perspective. How long does Isabel take to travel from Earth to Zorg? According to Isabel. What's the distance between the two planets? According to Isabel. Okay, so the fact that we're asking this whole set of questions really is a little unusual, right? So we're not used to thinking about time or distances in these ways. Okay, so let's see how we do this. So one way to do that is to work with the space-time interval. Okay, so for you we have two events. The two events are Isabel passes Earth and Isabel passes Zorg. Or you could say Isabel leaves Earth, Isabel arrives at Zorg. That all that's done at constant velocity. So between those two events, according to you, there's a time interval of 25 years, and those two events are separated in space by a distance of 20 light years. Okay, so now we're going to see what we get. There's our space-time interval equation, in case you forgot what it was. And so we'll work out the space-time interval based on those numbers, and then we'll see what Isabel thinks from her perspective, her reference frame. Okay, so in our case, when you say delta t is 25 years multiplied by c, which is one light year per year, then in the first bracket we get 25 light years all squared. Delta x, 20 light years, is 25 squared minus 20 squared, that's 625 light years squared minus 400 light years squared, that's 225 light years squared. And 225, take the square root of that, that's 15. So we get 15 light years all squared. So space-time interval comes out to be 15 light years. Okay, fine. Okay, so now we're going to do things from Isabel's perspective. So again, the two events we're talking about, Isabel passes Earth, or according to Isabel, the Earth passes Isabel. But the Earth and Isabel are next to each other. That's event one. Event two is Isabel and Zorg are next to each other. We say Isabel passes Zorg. Isabel looks out her rocket ship window and sees Zorg passing her. Okay, so for Isabel, what's the spatial separation between these two events? Okay, so according to Isabel, where is the Earth when the Earth passes her? Well, it's right outside her rocket ship window. For Isabel, where is Zorg when Zorg passes her? It's right outside her rocket ship window. Okay, so they occur, in fact, right where Isabel is. So both events occur at the same location, right outside Isabel's rocket ship window. So, spatial separation between the two events, according to Isabel, is zero. Delta x prime is zero. Okay, fine. So now, we'll make use of the space-time interval to see how much time has passed for Isabel between the two events. Okay, here's our space-time interval equation written in terms of primes. So we're going to uh, calculate, we're going to rearrange it so we get C delta T prime. And space-time interval is our 15 light years, which we get from your numbers. And delta X prime is zero. So in fact, C delta T prime is 15 light years, and delta T prime works out to 15 years. Okay, so this is crazy all by itself, right? You think between the two events of Isabel passing Earth and Isabel passing Zorg, 25 years have gone by. But Isabel observed only 15 years to have gone by between these same two events. Okay? So that's crazy all by itself. We don't think time works like this. We think of time as, as uh, not being different for different observers. But in fact, time is different. Time passes at different rates depending on what reference frame you're in, in fact. Okay? So it's a little bit crazy. So you got to change the way you think about time. Uh, the space-time interval can get you a long way if you know how to use it. 
And we can go on and talk about things like uh, time dilation, moving clocks run slow, we usually say. So, for instance, if you look at Isabel's watch as she passes by you, you will see it running slower than a comparable watch that you're wearing. However, Isabel says her watch is going fine, and she sees your watch running slowly. That's a little crazy. This also relates to what's called the twin paradox. Okay, If we send Isabel to Zorg, and then she comes back to the Earth, according to Isabel, 30 years will have gone by, 15 years to get there and 15 years to get back, assuming we're not going to worry about the fact that it's going to take her some time to turn around. But she ages 30 years, and you're going to claim that in that time you have aged 50 years. And that effect will be true. And the paradox here, which it turns out not really to be a paradox, is that according to Isabel's perspective, her clock's running fine and your clock is uh, going slow. So shouldn't she think that less time has passed on, on your clock than on her clock? Well, it turns out not to be true, and it's all associated with the fact that Isabel actually switches reference frames halfway through. So she switches from one that's going outbound from Earth to Zorg to one going the opposite direction from Zorg to, uh, to Earth, and that actually messes up all the clock readings. But it turns out to be exactly true. If this happens, we send Isabel to Zorg at this speed, 0.8c, when, when Isabel comes back, she will have aged 30 years, and you will have aged 50 years. If she was your twin, you would be 20 years older than her at that point. Okay, so there's some things to blow, to blow your mind, and we'll pick up from there when we get to class. Uh, except, no, we're not done yet. Oh, i got more things to do. Here we go. I forgot about this part. So here's something to consider. We observe light taking 20 years to travel from Earth to Zorg. Isabel says she only takes 15 years. Does this mean Isabel travels faster than light? Yes or no? Well, it turns out to be, in fact, no. So things are symmetric here. We see Isabel traveling at 80% of the speed of light, and Isabel sees Earth and Zorg traveling at 80% of the speed of light with respect to her. Okay, so she sees the two planets traveling at 80% of C pass by her 15 years apart. Ah, so there we can go calculate how far they are apart according to her. Okay, so they're traveling at four-fifths of the speed of light. They pass by her 15 years apart. Okay, how far apart are they? Distances, velocity times time. Four-fifths of C, C being one light year per year, uh, times 15 years, 12 light years. Okay, so you see the distance between the planets as 20 light years. Isabel sees only 12 light years. Okay, so here's another thing to blow your mind. So time's not acting like we think it does, should. Okay, we just have no um, experience with time doing this. And distances are really weird. Distances depends on what reference frame you measure them from. Okay, so we measure 20 light years. Uh, Isabel says, actually, it's only 60% of that. It's 12 light years. Okay, so we'll go from there when we get to class. How about that?